Hello and welcome to the Business Channel. Today we're looking at the green agenda and the move towards a low carbon economy. Businesses are no longer just thinking about tackling climate change, they're doing it. But the challenge is to find practical and cost-effective ways of cutting carbon emissions. Firstly, because we can no longer take fossil fuels for granted, we have to find cleaner and more efficient ways to power ourselves. And secondly, as we move towards an 80% cut in carbon, companies which get ahead of the curve have the chance to sell on pioneering new technologies and solutions. We face an urgent environmental and economic imperative to act on climate change. We're experiencing the effects of climate change now. Uh, that is very, a real threat uh, to our economy. Uh, we also have an economy which is increasingly exposed to a very volatile global energy market. Well, lowering carbon emissions, I think, is now important to everybody. You know what I mean? Not just not just uh, business. I think probably the thing that has to happen here is the culture has to change, and people have to start really thinking about reducing costs and reducing reducing energy. Um, from our business standpoint, it's obviously very important because the vast majority of our business our customers are either electricians or or, or businesses. And you know they're they're sitting in this position that they have to reduce costs, and and the good the good side in this here is that from our electrician standpoint, um, you know this is a win-win situation because they're getting they're doing work, they're providing a service, uh, the customer is reducing energy, and they're saving money at the same time. So you know this is not a very difficult business to be in. It's 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 a, I think it's probably an easier business to sell or an easier concept to sell. A green business is a valuable business for two basic reasons. The first is that a, a green business is an efficient business. Whether it's efficiency in terms of its energy use, in terms of its use of other resources, uh, in terms of the way that it manages waste and recycles, uh, fundamentally a green business should use less inputs than any other business. The second reason why a green business is a valuable business is that uh, becoming green, becoming environmentally friendly, becoming socially responsible requires uh, a, an emphasis on the governance of the business that will really drive the agenda and drive value. In terms of building the low carbon economy, we have been set challenges by the government and by the European Union to slash carbon intensity by 80% by 2050 and to deliver zero carbon new buildings uh, by 2019. Now nobody's ever built a zero carbon building, or arguably they claim they have, but effectively no new buildings are yet zero carbon. So now we as an organisation have to help our members learn from each other how they're going to do that so that all new buildings can be zero carbon. And then we have to understand how the whole of society can change all its building stock so it remains low carbon. The Green Agenda to our clients is very important. They've obviously are tasked now with reducing energy costs, or reducing energy rather, and our product helps us to enable our customers to do that by looking at what's going on within the building and gradually reducing the demand in electricity consumption and gas consumption of the buildings. Performance is already improving, less carbon is escaping, energy bills are being cut and even biodiversity is flourishing. These benefits only happen though if you have a clear idea of how everyday decisions affect your business. Then you can start to do better both financially and environmentally. Now the question that clients are asking us is, OK, so what do I actually need to do to perform well in the carbon reduction scheme because if it's going to be a real cost to my business what do I need to do? The answer is energy efficiency. How can you go down into the decision tree, create marginal abatement curves within that decision tree that give boards of directors real information which tells them what the payback will be of the different choices they might make about ways in which to drive energy efficiency into the business. Um, that, that kind of effort uh, is going to be necessary for anybody who's a heavy energy user to really make a difference to where they go next. 
The biggest challenge that our clients face in reporting is the huge range of things that they could possibly be telling the outside world. And to be able to gather information and have some real focus about what they're saying is proving quite tricky. The key to overcoming some of the challenges that they're facing is, is really not to look at sustainability reporting uh, as um, a, a brochure or an advertisement for the organisation, but to think of it as being a critical part of stakeholder engagement and a critical part of reporting to the wide variety of stakeholders who have an interest in business. What people now are really looking for, whether it's in a sustainability report or a corporate responsibility report, is openness, transparency and honesty about progress that's being made. I think that the key thing, the key thing you do is, is you try to provide people with the right product um, to reduce to, the right energy saving product, you know, and it's, it's too easy sometimes for, for suppliers to sell what they have, not what really the customer needs. And I think it's, again, this is where we're trying to deal with a lot of different manufacturers to be able to have the best selection. Uh, if it's a small, if it's a small job, um, or, you know, in some uh, customer contacts us, our own engineers can do, say, a lightning spec for them, be able to recommend what will give them what saving. Now, if it's a bigger job, we will use we would then use uh, some of the um, consultants. We use a company called Soltex Global. But again, you know, we, we, they then would use other consultants you know, right across the country because there's no real point in having somebody travelling all over the country to do this. There are loads of people in every area who are qualified and capable. So really what you want to do is, really what you want to happen here is if, if a customer has a requirement in a particular area, that you get a consultant in that area to go in and inspect the job, go in and see you know, what their real costs are currently, what their areas for saving are. And you know, sometimes you know, if you have a good consultant and they go in and do a good check here, you know, sometimes it's about the use of equipment, how they actually use the equipment they already have. And it's about having good people to go in and do, do that sort of respect to help people to get the end result. The HVCA has 1,500 businesses in the UK involved in the design, installation and maintenance of building services, that is, heating, ventilating, air conditioning and electrical services. The HVCA represents 1,500 member companies in the UK. The reduction in carbon emissions is fundamental to the UK economy, and particularly the low carbon built environment that contributes almost 50% of all carbon emissions. So for our members this is very important because they are involved in the day-to-day -day operation of these systems. So they design, install, maintain in order for those to be low energy systems, thus saving the client, the end user, money. Fundamentally our members work in three levels here. First of all they reduce energy consumption in the building which is at zero or very little cost generally. So they do that first of all. Then they're involved in the design of low carbon buildings, so you're designing out energy use. And then finally, through renewable energy systems, whatever energy you are using, you're using in a low carbon manner. So our members are involved in the delivery of those services. Many of the technologies we see, renewables, for example, uh, solar thermal in particular, or ground source heat pumps, or biomass to a degree, are actually full of the promise of carbon and energy savings, but only once they're fully integrated into a system that's already there, be it a heating system or hot water system, only then do they actually deliver on that promise of carbon and energy savings. So our members are really about the delivery rather than the promise of delivery. We can help the cl our clients with lowering emissions by the use of the building energy management system. In the building, uh, it's not really known but 75% of that is under our control so with the building management system we can help effectively lower those figures. Uh, as a typical example of how we've been able to help our customers, uh, one of our leading customers McDonald's UK Limited, um, they've had some very good sales growth this year 
and they've managed, we, with them, we've managed to help them sell to 20% more customers, but with actually using less energy. The savings in the McDonald's restaurants were achieved by installing a new building energy management system using the latest technology to control the building, inverters onto fans and waterless urinals. These all together effectively helped save the customers the amount of money. Another example would be a building in Basingstoke, Matrix House. In this building we updated the building energy management system. We then took out the task drives and replaced them for inverter drives and also fitted energy efficient fan motors. The savings then we achieved in this building were in the region of about 40%. The key thing that we do with our clients is we go through a presentation where we talk them through the way in which they can very practically and easily reduce their carbon emissions and their footprint um, and then we also look at what they can do um, with more uh, detailed measures in the way in which they construct and build their buildings. We also look at other significant alternative construction methods such as using carbon negative lime hemp walling um, which is a very new and exciting material that we've started to use on a lot of our projects. Um, that particular material um, we used the first commercial application in the UK was with Adnams um, the brewer on the Suffolk coast. They're now Europe's greenest brewer um, because they've embraced the green agenda and that building alone basically hoovered up 80 tonnes of CO2 out of the UK atmosphere. So that's two Wembley stadiums full and that's just with one building. And the key thing for Adnams is that they found that their energy bills are 50% of what they used to be with their previous distribution centre, um, but that is only a sixth of the current distribution centre size, so that means that's energy savings over 80%. Another good example was the Bowood Hotel down in Wiltshire. We've built a new 42-bed hotel and spa um, with restaurant, but we encourage the client to go for a biomass boiler um, and reed bed drainage. That means that there's no um, connection to the main sewerage system which had huge um, savings on the infrastructure costs with that project. And the biomass boiler, um, that basically saves the client an £86,000 a year gas bill at 2006 prices and he got payback in 27 months. Um, the other advantage is the two foresters, they're now tax exempt their salaries because they're feeding um, a green energy source. And biomass, whilst that's not appropriate in an urban context, um, certainly in that kind of rural location, is one of the most efficient carbon reducing uh, boilers that you can specify for generating heat and hot water. In more urban contexts, we're doing some quite innovative things like St Paul's Cathedral, where we're putting in ground source heat pumps. Um, that's on site at the moment, and that will obviously significantly help to reduce their carbon footprint and their carbon emissions um, in that much-loved and well-known uh, public icon. Another uh, fascinating project we worked on was the Athenaeum Hotel in Piccadilly. So there we replaced all of the glazing, which was 1960s, 70s style aluminium frame, single glazing, which was not thermally efficient. We replaced that with state-of-the-art double glazing, but with solar, thermal and acoustic performance. And we changed the windows so that they all became inward opening French doors with Juliet balconies overlooking Green Park. So um, they can actually do uh, natural ventilation, they're not reliant on air conditioning. And then the most striking thing that we also did was working with Patrick Blanc, we put Europe's tallest living wall on the prominent corner. That's nine storeys high, 226 plant types, um, and it's the first time it's been done on a carpet of recycled clothing with little kangaroo pouches for the root balls and an integral irrigation system. But that's increased the biodiversity of Piccadilly, it's oxygenating the atmosphere in an urban context and has also improve the thermal efficiency of the building. Buildings are one of the main sources of carbon. The materials we choose, the heating, the lighting, the ventilation, all have far-reaching consequences. How can we make better decisions to reduce their environmental impact? Buildings and the emissions in buildings is an important piece of the low carbon story and the ideas that government have around a green deal are really exciting and off, could offer a really unique opportunity if done properly to reduce emissions, particularly in households. Then at the 
um, sort of the other piece of the story is around how we develop those opportunities, how we develop the markets for businesses for low carbon goods and services particularly thinking about the innovation and the low carbon innovation going on in this country and how we can encourage the really innovative thinking in um, particularly SMEs, how we can encourage that and expand it and actually make it not just an opportunity for the UK but how we can create export opportunities and in fact in a way a manufacturing renaissance for UK business. There are approximately 26 million buildings existing in the UK. The rate of replacement of those buildings means that we could replace the whole lot in about 400 years. We have to reduce the carbon impact of those buildings by at least 80% by 2050, which means refurbishing one a minute. It's said now in hotels that energy costs are 60 to 70% percent uh, is, is caused by lighting. Now, there's a lot can be done on this here. You know, if, if people are using conventional lighting, you can you move to uh, compact fluorescence or com energy saving lamps, and you have immediately 60-70% saving. Now, if you take it a bit further than that and you go to LED lighting, which is ultimately, I think, where everybody's going to go with this. Um, and the difficulty at the moment is that LED is still quite expensive. but. You know, I think that companies have to really look at it, and the government, I think governments should look at this. If they're providing energy saving loans, I think that they should slant them in favour of people who are using LED lighting, because that's a much better long-term result. Um, it's much better when it comes to the end of the cycle. Uh, they don't have to have special treatment, as you will have to have with a lot of low energy lamps, which contain mercury, whereas, uh, to the best of my knowledge, most of all LED um, will be will be straightforward scrappage. So, I think there's a lot. There's, there's, there's a big range of products there, and um, probably probably one of the advantages for us as a distributor uh, is that we can select from everybody's product. The key thing that I find working in the industry is it's very difficult when you're wanting to specify materials to genuinely find out how green and sustainable they are. If we could see in the construction industry where the carbon legacy of a material, in other words, how much carbon has gone into the atmosphere to actually produce that material before we then specify it. We also need to be looking at where that material is coming from and how it's actually transported to the UK. At the same time, we also want to know not only the manufacturing and the deliverability, but what it is actually going to do as a material. And that also needs to be looked at not just as a material in isolation, but how it performs in context. Because so often you find that what it says on paper is true because that's a lab test, but when it's then put in the context of a building, um, it certainly doesn't perform that way. So it's all of those kinds of criteria that we need as professionals to be able to advise our clients what is the best and the most commercially appropriate um, specification of materials and building type whilst also giving them good commercial return. Buildings are responsible for 40% of global energy use and about 20% of global water use. So there's an incredible opportunity for us to help the architects and the engineers who are building those buildings make better decisions. We are trying to embed the ecological intelligence into the design software so that we're bringing information early to the design process so that these customers, the architects, engineers, can make better decisions. They can understand what the energy footprint of a building is long before they've actually built that building. And so that's pretty significant when you think about the fact that most of environmental impacts are fixed and determined in the design process. Different solutions apply for different types of buildings. Um, it's important to recognise that also the geography of, of that particular site is also going to have a large impact in terms of the uh, demand for energy on the site, but also the availability of renewable energy sources for that site. So if we look at, for example, wind as a renewable source um, within the town centre, which may be very congested, perhaps uh, not a particularly uh, high wind area, then as a renewable source that isn't going to be particularly effective. So what our technology helps designers to do is to better understand the availability of renewable sources and the usefulness of them in that context. We really need 
to help educate across a wide section of the construction industry and indeed the property industry. Now, SIBSI has been uh, a minority sport, you might say. It's a small section. We deal specifically with the energy producing equipment in buildings. Uh, up till now, that's all been about comfort. It's all been about just delivering comfortable buildings and enjoyable places to be in. Now we have to change that. And that is not a simple exercise because we have been doing calculations on the use of energy in buildings forever. But in order to change the amount of energy they use, we have to teach people how to build differently. And that's called building engineering physics. And that involves construction members and it involves architects and surveyors and all those people have long-standing institutions and we need to influence them and we need to do it positively. Low energy, low carbon, low cost. In the public sector particularly, this is an attractive formula. First you lead the way on climate change, then you do your bit to cut public spending. As well as working in the private sector, we've been doing some interesting work in the public sector. Um, we're currently working with the new House of Lords offices, which is going to get a Briam very good. That's in a refurbished building, so quite a difficult uh, situation. It's also a listed building, but that's where we're um, practically working to deliver green and sustainable uh, buildings um, at the heart of Parliament but we're also working down at the uh, Greenwich National Maritime Museum, the new Sami Offer Wing there, that also gets Briam very good, and that's a huge um, extension and archive store for the National Maritime Museum. Our members are helping the public sector reduce their costs by identifying waste is the easiest thing to do first off. So you, you, you work out where you are actually using energy and using it inefficiently. So it's about identifying where waste is, reducing that. And most of those things are zero or no cost, very little. Uh, there may be some behavioural change things as well, there, but there may be some technology, but most of it is low cost. You then design systems that operate well within the low carbon built environment, that are practical, that the end user can firstly understand and use. If they can do that, then they're likely to deliver on the low carbon building low carbon, low energy and therefore low cost to operate. And finally they can use low carbon solutions specifically like renewable energy systems in order to, if you cannot, if you have to generate for example, if you have to use energy to heat our buildings, then you may as well do it in a low carbon way. Our work in the public sector has been mainly involved in the House of Commons Parliament building where we've taken on a five-year project where we've upgraded the existing BMS system to a new trend BMS system. The work that we carried out there was effectively to bring all the building systems into one by fitting the trend system. This trend system then has enabled us to help the Parliament in the reducing of the CRC allocation. Businesses want government to provide incentives for good behaviour and penalties for poor performance. A clear, stable framework means money flows to whoever competes best in a green economy. As far as the law goes, what we're concerned about is enforcement of the law. Currently there is a lack of enforcement at all levels and therefore uh, there is a culture of non-compliance developing in the UK. Uh, and where you have a culture of non-compliance, then if it doesn't really matter whether a building is up to standard or not, then you will get people who won't deliver on that. And therefore you'll get poorly performing buildings, which is to nobody's benefit. Business gets the sustainability agenda. Uh, everybody understands energy efficiency as, as, as a good idea. Uh, actually, everybody understands water, other resource management as being a good idea. Uh, what business is looking for, what financial institutions are looking for, uh, is a degree of stability and certainty in the legislative framework. So incentivizing good behavior, um, disincentivizing uh, the environmentally or socially irresponsible behaviour uh, and making sure that it's, it's easy for capital to flow towards the, 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 the businesses that behave themselves uh, and therefore allowing um, business to get on with what it does best, which is identifying customer needs and satisfying those needs. 
A good example of this is there's a number of large businesses have approached the EU recently uh, and they've approached the EU specifically to ask the EU to set some harder targets for business to, uh, to, 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 to reduce its, its carbon footprint. Uh, and the reason that they do that is because they recognise that, that they have to balance the needs of different stakeholders, they need to balance the, the, the making a return for their investors and doing it within a legislative framework. So if the legislative framework isn't there, um, then, then it's very hard for them to act. So that they are asking for that legislative framework is very, very telling uh, about the extent to which business is engaged in the debate. The green revolution in business has started. Attitudes are changing. Extraordinary goals are being set. We are at the start of a journey towards cutting our use of carbon by 80% in a generation. Few have any illusions about the difficulties as well as the potential that these changes represent. The vast majority of businesses accept that their energy strategies are not fit for purpose. They now recognise that a radical process of change is about to begin. Well, that's all we've got time for at the moment, but if you want to find out more about any of the organisations that we've featured, then go to thebusinesschannel.tv or download via iTunes by searching for The Business Channel TV. Bye-bye for now.